So here are some of the basics of our cosmological framework. A language or a code is a finite set of symbols called letters. A symbol is an object, okay, so it can be anything. You don't have to think about a letter like in English. So it's just think about a, a code as having some number of things like zero and one, or the 26 letters of the English alphabet, or any other finite set of things that are different from one another, things, objects. And then there's rules in languages or codes on how you can arrange those objects. So how the symbols can be networked. They don't have to be, I say network because they don't have to be written in a line. Some things do, like C++ or English, but not all symbolic languages must be written in a line, so I call it a network. So these rules govern how the symbols can be networked in a hierarchical fashion to express emergent meaning, such as how letters emerge to form words, which then emerge to form sentences, and then paragraphs, and so on. And then finally, to define a code or a language, you have to have within the rules syntactical freedom that gives you two or more ways that symbols and groups of symbols can be networked. So in this sense, the action or expression of a code or language is itself emergent, right? Always, whether it's a bird language or a computer coding language and evolutionary and hierarchical in the sense that evolution is a complex hierarchy where simpler things composite to make emergent things that are less simple. Quantum gravity is a language. It meets those, those three definitions. So we started with letters that are fun called fundamental particles. So the very beginning story in the Big Bang uh, picture, uh, we started with quarks and gluons as our letters, and then they self-organized to higher complexity to become the early hydrogen universe, where our first teams of quarks and electrons grouped up to form the very first atoms. So the, the finite set of symbols, or letters, particles, are grouping up now in the early universe, and then those letters got arranged in various ways according to very strict rules of quantum mechanics and gravity, and also very helpful degrees of syntactical freedom that are explained by quantum mechanics. The rules have syntactical freedom in the sense that they are uh, non-deterministic. A relationship between two or more particles can be either like this or like that, but there are other relationships prohibited by the rules of quantum mechanics. The universe has a broken symmetry or direction of time in the form of increasing complexity. Fundamental particles, like electrons, are the letters, and then they self-organize into atoms. So think of these as letters and atoms as words. And they have, as we know, very strict rules. You can't just make any kind of atom. There's rules and syntactical freedom that allows you to make a bunch of different types of words, but not any old word you want. So then over time, those hydrogen atoms under the force of gravity move from a misty, homogeneous, early hydrogen universe to be clumped up into stars. Now that clumping up was a higher form of complexity than the mist of the early hydrogen universe. And then over longer time, those stars self-organized those hydrogen atoms to form certain reactions governed by quantum mechanics that generated about 100 different other atomic words, such as carbon and iron. And then these self-organize into planets. And then those solar systems of planets self-organized into galaxies. And then they self-organized into galaxy clusters. 
So we can see, you know, this increasing complexity as the universe keeps expressing itself with this code because all languages are hierarchical and have emergent structure. This is the meaning of physicality. So physical structures are just as much meaning as some abstract meaning. So this is the less talked about arrow of time. So eventually this gravitational self-organization produced an environment on at least one planet where atoms organized into molecules capable of encoding data that governs the sequencing of quantum thermodynamic micro events. Every chemical reaction in your body, every thought that you have is really the result of an unimaginable concatenation in, in network space of these quantum thermodynamic micro events that's all encoded in this vast genetic architectural code that took pretty much four billion years to, to get it to where it's at. And then that led to the emergence of extremely complex systems called single-celled organisms. And then those little life forms speciated and self-organized into cities of 37 trillion citizens where a division of labor occurred to form your body and consciousness. Now, in the same sense that they live their life, make their choices, run from toxins, reproduce, excrete, do their little primitive life stuff, they have no idea that you're up there at the top, right? You are capable of knowing them through the process of science, microscopes and these things. But they're just not as smart as you. So what if we're like that, where our consciousnesses connect over time in some new future quantum gravity theory, and we have no idea that we're like cells like these in a vast transtemporal neural network wherein something even more conscious can emerge. This directional increase in complexity continues like how individual consciousnesses self-organize to form collective systems such as communism, capitalism, and stock markets, right? These are emergent things that cannot emerge from the behavior of one mind, but that require large networks of minds for something like the stock market or science itself is such a thing. So no one person and no group of people in one time period can do this time domain creation of collections of consciousnesses that we call science. The self-simulation hypothesis cosmology requires higher forms of collective consciousness to emerge in order to form the substrate of the self-simulated universe. So we have evidence that incredibly high consciousness emerges in the form of ourselves or other animals that we think are very smart. So here we see all of science as mankind officially knows it. We know about plate tectonics, we know about biomechanics, we know about crystallography, we know about astronomy, we know a lot about DNA, we know about fundamental particles and their statistical behaviors. So it's amazing what we've accomplished so far. But the self-simulation hypothesis cosmology places two bookends onto the stuff that we know in the middle. And these two bookends are absolutely not part of status quo science.
So one bookend is a pre-physical mathematical substrate and a simple program that is not part of status quo. And at the other end is the pan-consciousness substrate that holds this. So the first bookend is a rejection of the idea that particles are fundamental. For us, they are emergent from a pre-physical mathematical substrate called E8. So think of E8 as a game board. So it's just a piece of math that many simple programs or games could be run on. Like how a checkerboard allows you to play chess or checkers. And then think of our savings-based Empire Cycle Clock simple programs as just one class of games on that game board that happens to create emergent statistical patterns that we recognize as physicality. So this physicality is the fundamental particles and quantum statistical forces that allow various emergent self-organizing patterns, such as atoms. The other bookend, not part of status quo physics, is the emergent mind-like substrate capable of holding the mathematical game board and the simple program that runs on it. So these two bolt-on objects to the status quo scientific picture are like two capstones of the most extreme nature. One is at the Planck scale and is pre-physical pure math and the pan-consciousness substrate is at the cosmological scale and runs through all of time. It is astounding to imagine how an emergent consciousness of this magnitude could evolve in the, in the future. But it is equally astounding to see that human consciousness emerged from a quark-gluon plasma. If the philosophy of linear time were true, it would not be possible for the pan-consciousness substrate to hold the game board, the mathematical substrate, in order to self-actualize reality and therefore itself. But if quantum gravity turns out to be inherently non-local, we would be allowed to wrap the linear hierarchy into a loop in a logically consistent cosmological framework. Now in this cosmology, everything is transtemporally influencing everything else across the entire emergent hierarchical evolutionary stack of emergent strata. You know, such that you're being influenced non-locally by some person way over here and some star way over there a billion years ago. The whole thing is in a topologically connected quantum gravity theory, non-local like this would be allowed in principle. So just as it is confusing to visualize 4D in space, it is strange to envision a three plus one kind of time evolution that is transtemporal. It's just, it's complicated and hard to get your arms around the more you think about it. Now, a linear time evolution is simple because each step only causes the next step after it. And that kind of view would certainly be more at peace with our internal bias to see the world around us as classical and local. When retrocausality is allowed, it makes every event a member of a feedback loop between other events in both directions of time. <laughs> 